All right. Um, hi, everyone. It's so nice to see all of your faces. Um, this is the DS 2.0 planning meeting, the first session. Um, I'm so excited to talk with all of you over the next uh, four sessions about the future of DS. And um, I think it's going to be a great, uh, a great few days. Um, I'm going to chat out a link to a Google Drive or um, to a Google group, sorry, um, that's in the chat now. Um, we've set that up as a place where we all can um, converse with each other um, and ask questions um, throughout these two weeks and um, keep the conversations going um, in between the meetings. And I'm also going to share with you a link to a Google Drive folder. Um, let's see. And um, that folder has all of the documents we'll be referring to over the next couple of days, including the agenda um, and the institutional survey results, which I will be talking about um, in a minute. Um, I should also say um, I'm Emma Thompson. I'm the project manager for DS 2.0. Um, I know some of you already, but it's nice to meet all of you. Um, and now I will hand it over to our first speaker today, Deborah Cashin. She's the executive director of Digital Scriptorium, and um, she's going to set the stage for us as far as um, the current state of DS. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Emma. Um, and I uh, want to uh, welcome everybody and thank you all for coming. Um, Emma said we've got 54 people in the meeting, which is really fantastic. I'm very excited about the enthusiasm and support we've had for DS in uh, recent uh, weeks. Uh, we had our annual meeting for a digital scriptorium on September 25th on Zoom, and we had 66 people on that meeting. Um, so this is really exciting that we got this support in a community of manuscript scholars and librarians and students and just general supporters. I'm really excited about that. Um, what I want to do is briefly um, just talk about as president and executive director of DS, I want to give you a kind of context for in which um, this meeting um, uh, takes place, um, especially when it, uh, if you aren't familiar with Digital Scriptorium, um, I'm just going to walk you through some of the, uh, the constructs of what Digital Scriptorium is. It's not just a database. Digital Scriptorium is actually a consortium that's um, shored up by um, uh, various legal and financial ins um, instruments. And a lot of that, a lot of those have been crafted recently by the present board of directors. Um, we've done a lot of hard work um, for the last five years to get DS in the position so that we can um, apply for grants and, apply and accept uh, charitable donations. So I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to take you to the DS website. So because all, all, we try to be very transparent about the organization um, and all of our public documents are posted on the website. It's a really good place to go if you have questions about digital scriptorium. So let me just share my screen here. Um, how can I do this? It does not look like my screen. Here we go. Here we go. So this is the DS website. It's a digital scriptorium.org. Um, and you can see here what right off the bat, digital script, the website explains that digital scriptorium is a consortium. It's not a database. It's a consortium that has a database of American libraries, meaning uh, libraries in, uh, in the United States and museums committed to free online access to their collections of pre-modern manuscripts. And then if you skip down to the second paragraph, it explains that the consortium comprises a variety of institutions from large research universities to small public libraries and private museums with collections of assorted size and significance from a few single leaves to hundreds of bound volumes. Um, there are uh, right now, we just brought in two new um, institutions. So there are 37 um, institutions participating in DS at this point. Um, 12 of those, no, 13 of those are uh, what we call associates and the rest are uh, members. Uh, members pay fees on a sliding scale. 
Um, you can look that up. The, um, we have a weighted fee schedule um, that is explained online um, in a chart that shows that we have uh, people that the uh, institutions that do pay fees pay from 500 to 2000 a year, but one third of our uh, participating institutions do not pay fees. Um, we call them associates. They also do not then have a vote in the um, organization, but the otherwise can, can, uh, can participate as fully as they wish to, including um, sit, uh, there's three seats on the board of directors. They're called directors at large and um, associates are eligible to sit on those, um, to have those seats on the board of directors. Um, you can see we have, we now have bank accounts and PayPal account and we can accept donations online. Um, um, and we also have an investment account and um, an investment policy, which we never had before. It'd be so aspirational, but we um, have $10,000 at this point in that account and it would be wonderful if someday DS could have an endowment, but we don't have that now. So what I'm gonna take you to next is the governance page. The page of, um, on the website, this page explains who is running the, um, the consortium and um, that includes the seven board of directors, um, four of whom are officers. Those officers must be, um, uh, uh, they must represent member institutions. Like I said, the directors at large can be from um, anywhere. They can actually, there's actually no restrictions on who, who can hold those seats. So they could actually be, from, be held by people outside of the organization. The advisory council are people that we've asked to sort of back up the, um, the, the board of directors. Um, some of those, those, in the past, those positions have been really honorary honoraria, but um, now um, under the Lisa Pagan Davis, we've asked her to sit as um, chair of the advisory council. We're trying to build the advisory council as a more of a standing committee for, uh, for the board, especially one that represents uh, scholars and users of DS. Um, we post all of our minutes on, on the governance page. You can also see our bylaws here and our memorandum of understanding. And that's what I want to take you to next is the memorandum of understanding. Um, this has been drawn up again with a, uh, th through a hard work of the board and with the advice of legal counsel. Um, it shows here again some of the things I've told you, but including that we're uh, a 501c3 organization, which under the that's a, a part of the IRS code for charitable um, or uh, nonprofit organizations which means that we are tax exempt. Um, you can have a nonprofit that isn't tax exempt. If, it's for, if uh, you have a nonprofit just for the benefit of the members like a golf club or a country club, but um, if you want 501c3 status, you must, rep you must have a mission that goes beyond the benefit of your membership. And I'll talk about that in a second, but that's something that's I think important for DS to remember that it needs to be, uh, its mission needs to focus on not just its membership, but on the benefit of a greater uh, cause or a larger uh, culture than just the membership itself, um, or it would lose its 5013C status. Um, I told you about the fees before and the governance um, and the annual meeting we had, we just had that. It's usually an all day meeting um, and we rotate where that meeting's held with the idea of uh, being able uh, to make it convenient for different people in different parts of the country. But this year, we, again, because of COVID, we held it online and it was really pretty successful online. Um, so, um, and then the catalog is listed in the MOU. We um, have some brief um, uh, explanation here of the data and the images that go into that, but there's another page on the website that's called for content contributors that explains this in much greater detail. Um, but like, we, uh, like it says here, the members and associates are encouraged to contribute records to DS online catalog, but you, but an institution really could belong to the consortium and not contribute anything at all. They just wanna support the, the work of DS. Um, and then um, th the mission statement is here. Um, and this I think is the, the part, I think we need to, this is part of our, um, articles of incorporation. So this is something to keep in mind during these meetings. And especially if we decide that DS 2.0 um, doesn't align with the mission statement, then we need to make a recommendation to the board of directors to, um, 
to uh, revise the mission statement. That would have to be done. I, everything's up for grabs, so everything can be rethought, but I wanted to let you all know that although the database is antiquated, the, uh, the corporate infrastructure for DS isn't, and it's actually been very recently uh, 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 shorn up and uh, improved from what it was before. But I do, I want to go over this just quickly and then I'll, I'll hand this, um, hand things back to um, uh, Emma and uh, Lynn Ransom, who's going to talk more about the meetings that we're going to hold. But the, to keep in mind that the mission statement of Digital Scriptorium is that it's a consortium committed to providing cross institutional digital access to their collections, to the collections of pre modern manuscripts in American libraries and museums. And we also have a vision statement, which is to enhance access and appreciation of historically significant but often understudied manuscript materials. Um, we focused a lot traditionally on the access. I don't think DS has done what it could in terms of uh, enhancing appreciation of historically significant materials. So that's something to think about too when we're talking about DS 2.0, um, whether there are some kinds of educational outreach options or things like that that we could do to enhance the appreciation of manuscripts that we all love. And then the goals of the mission are listed here and, and those are to prov provide bibliographic descriptions according to the recognized standards of practice, to include images that complement, expand, and correct verbal descriptions, to facilitate searches that provide answers, provoke questions, invite collaboration, to create a community of scholars, librarians, and curators, and other citizen scholars for the purpose of sharing scholarship, and to support open access to works in the public domain. So that's that's a that's a real drive by what DS is. If you have uh, any questions, you can always email me. Um, I'm especially uh, focused on the and have been on the governance of DS for the last five years. Um, but also the website, as I said, has lots of more explanation about what D DS is as a consortium and as a, um, as a, as a nonprofit corporation. You can also use the website to um, get rid of this. The website, if you go to the website and you do a search, you can do a, a, go to simple search and do a browse search by location and you'll see the collections in DS according to um, you know, the different contributors, uh, institutional contributors. And then if you can just pick one of those, if you want to, and this is St. Louis, which I represent, you can see that St. Louis has 66 records in digital scriptorium. And the, those can be refined if you um, want to by um, these faceted search tools that we added to DS a couple of years ago. You can refine by, uh, you can filter by country, um, century, um, and language um, so that you can, and you can do that with any search so that you can narrow it down to things that you're most interested in. I um, just wanna show you what one DS record looks like now so we can decide where, how we're going to, um, you know, what, so you can decide again what the box is so that we can think outside the box. Right now DS records are faceted by, according to three um, parts, three, three sections, the first one DS calls the part, then if a better way to I think understand it is the context, the historical context for a manuscript, or the, the, the DS calls this the manuscript, which is very vague. The second part of a DS record is called the part, and that is actually refers to the carrier, the physical carrier of the manuscript. And then the third part of a DS record is called the text, but that really refers to the content of a record, what you might, um, consider and uh, closest to most library records. And this is where you would talk about the author and the uh, title and incapits and expl explicates. So again, I, I'll leave it to you guys to, that we, you, you can see we're having an image problem at Berkeley right now. We do have images with these records though. And if you click on view image, they're still sh they still should be showing up. It takes you to the open sea dragon viewer where you can see that we've got, um, you know, manuscripts, um, you know, uh, uh, most of uh, the institutions that have contributed so far um, have pretty pretty high resolution um, images. We um, the old-fashioned system for um, 
submitting um, images to DS's to send TIFFs to Berkeley, and which is again, uh, um, probably not the way we want to go with DS 2.0, but that's another thing we can talk about. But anyway, so that's the, that's the, the that's the drive-through tour of the um, Digital Scriptorium website. Um, and like I said, if you have questions about it, explore it yourself or send questions to me. And I'm going to hand the um, discussion back to Emma and uh, Lynn Ransom, our Secretary of Digital Scriptorium. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, you feel free to post questions as you think of them. Um, and we'll answer them after each presentation. Um, for now, I will hand the mic over to Lynn Ransom. She's the PI for the DS 2.0 grant and also the curator of programs at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at Penn. Thank you, Emma, and thank you everyone for coming. This is really exciting to see so many familiar faces, a lot of new faces, um, and I look forward to getting to know many of you virtually over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, I have a PowerPoint I'm gonna start with. Is it sharing? No, it's not sharing yet. How's that? That's good. All right, excellent. So you all know who I am. Um, so the whole reason for this planning meeting is that we decided, the board of directors decided, uh, you know, back in 2015, when we all sort of started at the same time, um, that, that Digital Scriptorium was kind of facing a moment of crisis where uh, we, you know, there are questions about financial sustainability, there, and the really huge question about technical sustainability. Uh, Digital Scriptorium was created in the late 90s, and I think it started out as an access database. Um, and it had this sort of nested architecture where you have what, you know, Deborah showed you the sort of the context, the manuscript, the part, the text, the image. And this kind of nesting um, was, was, was a really interesting and innovative way to try to uh, bring together metadata about all the different parts that make up a manuscript. Um, but in the long run, it, it's, it's, uh, it's become kind of outdated and I think Deborah used the word antiquated um, to such an extent that it's kind of hard to keep up. And so we now have to kind of figure out what else to do. Um, this is made even more pressing by the fact that Berkeley is changing its digital library architecture and will not be able to host, <clears throat> excuse me, host digital scriptorium um, in its current state uh, or after the next couple of years. So at, at a certain point, we will not be able to have Digital Scriptorium on the Berkeley website. And so we need to think of a way and we need to be imaginative about this and creative about how we might move Digital Scriptorium forward so that we don't um, kind of repeat the problems that we have now in terms of an institutional host, in terms of a database that's kind of um, heavy in terms of data uh, that's sort of hard to access. I don't want to say clunky because that sounds like I'm insulting. It's a very good database, but it is hard to sort of get into it and move it around and add data uh, and take data out and that sort of thing. So we decided that uh, we were going to plan a digital scriptorium 2.0. Um, let's see. There it goes. And uh, we looked towards the IMLS for a funding opportunity and we found one. So back in uh, September of last year, we submitted a pre-proposal for Digital Scriptorium 2.0, a national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts in US collections for the digital age to the IMLS, um, to their National Digital Infrastructures and Initiatives grant um, th that's part of their national leadership grants for a libraries program. Uh, we were allowed to move forward, obviously, and in March we submitted the final application and we found out the last week of July for a project that was to start August 1st that we got the grant. Um, and it's great. So now we have a one-year planning, or we're beginning a one-year planning phase to redevelop the technical infrastructure of digital scriptorium. 
Um, and the final objective that we wrote into the grant is to transform the DS digital platform into an inclusive, open access, online national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts housed in US institutional collections, which is a big goal and a kind of, kind of vague goal. And what we need to do now is sort of narrow down how we're gonna do that. I just wanted to run through uh, the schedule for this planning year and uh, give you an idea of how this is gonna move forward. So month one was hiring the project manager, that was Emma Thompson, and luckily she was ready to go uh, on August 1st. Uh, we sent out a member survey, and thank you to those of you who have filled out a member survey. And if, you're, if your institution has not submitted one, um, perhaps that's something that we could ask you to do a little bit later just to make sure that we have your input. Um, we have planned two stakeholder meetings or planning meetings, and the first one is occurring now. Uh, we'll have another meeting <clears throat> at the end of the uh, grant period in month 11. With any luck, this will be an in-person meeting. Um, probably with the, way, with the way things are going, uh, we'll be doing it virtually. But uh, these are opportunities for us to bring people together and brainstorm. So in between these times, uh, Emma will be conducting a data content assessment and just a full assessment of Digital Scriptorium as a platform. Then in month four, she'll be begin an environmental scan looking at other projects, other technologies that we might want to incorporate or that could be seen as models or um, as challenges, etc. cetera, uh, for a Digital Scriptorium 2.0. And then in month six, we'll begin um, with luck uh, developing a data model. So by the middle of the project, we hope to have an idea of how we're going to do this, what in sort of sketchy terms a DS 2.0 is going to look like, and then we'll build a model, you know, a way that we're going to, you know, collect data and put it out there. Uh, this is not, we're not going to have to produce a, a working database. This is just a planning phase. And so, so what we will have is a model of, of how this data will work. And then we'll have a implementation plan, um, hopefully by month 12, that we can take to funding agencies. And then throughout there'll be project reports that Emma will submit to the board and that we will share with uh, the DS uh, constituency. So moving into how we're gonna do this. And I said, you know, we're gonna have to be sort of imaginative and creative about this. Um, and, and, and I want you to keep that in mind. Um, back when we start, we were pre-planning, we had a meeting at the Beinecke Library uh, in February of 2018. And we spent two and a half days sort of like knocking around what we wanted. And we came up with a list of principles that we again wrote into the grant um, of what we wanted DS 2.0 to be. We wanted to provide a low barrier to both the contribution and use of metadata and images. We want to build upon a clear, adaptable, and scalable data model. We want to employ linked and linkable data. We want to support interoperability with other manuscript research projects. And we want, <clears throat> excuse me, want to enable content contributors to maintain management and ownership of the data while sharing in the continuing benefits of national collaboration. And so these are our principles, and these are what, what we want you to think about as we move forward in this planning meeting. How do we get to these uh, principles, how do we achieve them? One of the first things we need to do is define for ourselves what is a national union catalog. Uh, is it a list or a census of manuscripts? Uh, I was, sorry, I'm seeing uh, typos in my, my, my uh, slide. Is this a list of all manuscripts in a, uh, in, a, in a country? Is it a full descriptive catalog of all manuscripts? Um, is it you know, something like Digital Scriptorium is now? Uh, and then what do we expect to get from a National Union catalog? Discovery, do we wanna find all manuscripts? Research, do we wanna be able to research and analyze the data on those manuscripts? Do we want access to those manuscripts? Do you want access to the data, to the metadata, uh, to the images? Or do we want all of this? You know, what, what do we want? And there's probably a lot more things that we could put on this list of expectations. As many of you know, uh, 
many countries have tried this before. Um, so I want to give you a brief rundown of, of the history of what I call the effort to produce a national union catalog because it's really difficult and it's not something you can necessarily do very uh, easily as you might think. Um, back in the 19th century, countries started thinking that they needed to uh, account for their, you know, for the, for the manuscripts that were in their possession. Uh, this is part of cultural history, intellectual history, national history, etc. France was one of the first ones to do this with their public libraries outside of the Bibliothèque Nationale. And you can see it started in 1949, and the last one was published in 1960. That's, that's a long time to be working on a catalog. It went through various iterations, various um, editors, et cetera. Italy did the same thing. They, pro they produced 116 volumes, started in 1890. And I think the last one was uh, completed uh, in 2013. And we all know uh, Seymour de Ricci's census of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts in the United States. This one took relatively uh, less time, a lot less time than the other ones, partly because the US has a lot fewer manuscripts. Um, but it, you know, just looking at this slide, the limitations of this, the print medium, um, so whereas de Ricci was able to publish it and research it and publish it in a span of 15 or 20 years, um, as soon as it's printed, it's out of date. So in 1962, they do a sort of an update of the census. Um, and thanks to the efforts of Melissa Conway and Lisa Finnegan Davis, who are both here, uh, we have an update to that, um, to the directory in terms of the collection. So it's not necessarily another census. They're not saying where every single manuscript is now, but what has happened to those collections that were in uh, Dorici. And these, this work is very valuable and will be uh, extremely helpful to us as we move forward. But again, it's a print medium. And as soon as you put it out, it's out of date. So we're moving into the, we've moved into the digital world. Um, I've got some examples of a few different uh, attempts. The Manuscript to Medievalia, this is a German site that allows you to sort of find documentation about manuscripts in German collections. There's eCodices, which for many is the, you know, the great model for digital, uh, for, for digital online catalog of manuscripts uh, in Switzerland. And it's, it's a fantastic, um, but a rather expensive model. And then there's of course Digital Scriptorium, which has been uh, working to be a national union catalog of manuscripts in the U.S. since its beginnings, and we're still working on that. So just with finishing off that sort of history, um, let's turn now again to what, what DS 2.0 is going to look like. So here are the project principles again for your review. Now how do we do this, right? Basically, we have to answer a lot of questions first. In addition to what is a national union catalog, um, we now have to think about what, what the scope is. You know, is this a, a, a national union catalog of European manuscripts? Is this a national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts? What does pre-modern mean? Uh, what are we gonna include in this? What's the chronology? Um, Dorici stopped at 1600. I'm not sure, I can't actually, Deborah can remind me about this or Consuelo, uh, if there's a cutoff date for digital scriptorium, but generally anything after 1600 is not considered medieval. Um, but if you're working with Islamic manuscripts, you know that, that that date doesn't quite work. So do we increase the scope? And what does that mean when you start increasing the scope? Um, another question is, what is the level of cataloging and descriptive data um, and digitizing? Like, what, it, what is desirable and what is possible? Um, what will our data model look like? Uh, Deborah's already shown you the digital script form. She took, took you through a record, which was actually very helpful because what I have here is just a screenshot. So the possible models are digital scriptorium, or you, you try to get as much information about the manuscript as you can, where it came from, where it's located, who wrote it, what's in it, uh, who the artist is, uh, and then a sampling of images. Um, 
because digital scriptorium started in 1997. I think the idea was that, you know, at least get a few images up um, because no one could, could handle sort of cover to cover uh, digitization at that point. Ecodices, uh, which started in 2005, uh, and, and again, I'm showing you a screenshot of what is actually a really long record that went on. I was scrolling down through this today, um, several pages with full descriptive information, almost everything that you want to know, think you want to know about a particular manuscript is in uh, this record. And you also get full uh, digital coverage of it. Another model is going in the opposite direction, so less data. What is the basic information that you need in order to find a manuscript and get a sense of what it is? Um, the Schoenberg database is not a union catalog. It's not a catalog of manuscripts. Um, this is a different topic, but the idea is kind of the same, where you just supply enough information so that you can search on title, you can search on materials, you can use folio count to narrow searches. You can identify people involved in the production and the history of ownership, uh, and you can find out where it is. Um, another thing that this model introduces is linked data. So where, where you can see the blue text, those are links that take you to uh, authority files within the Schoenberg database. And within those authority files, um, there are links to outside authority, authority files. So for our name authority, we link to the Virtual International Authority file, or VIAF, or VIAF, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, for places, we link to uh, the Getty uh, Geographic Thesaurus, GeoNames, um, et cetera. And so we're introducing into this model the idea of linkability, of being able to get from uh, a record in your catalog, in your database, to other databases, uh, just with a click of a button. Um, another model is one that is in develop that that in development that uh, Christoph Fluler has been working on. This is something called the International Standard Manuscript Identifier, and again, this is not necessarily meant to be a union catalog or, or a catalog, but a method of attaching a unique number or character set, alphanumeric character set, whatever it turns out to be, to a manuscript. And so wherever that manuscript goes, that number goes with it. So unlike a shelf mark, which will change when a manuscript moves, this unique identifier will, will stay with that manuscript. And in the sketch of the data model that I'm showing you here, the sort of outline of it, because it, I don't think it's been produced yet, and you can sort of get a sense of what kind of data they're gonna be collecting. So there are links to languages, country. Let me see if I can see if this works. Can't seem to use my pointer. Um, to sort of geo names, uh, the URIs, to III manifest, DOIs, et cetera. Places where more identifiers could be found. So you could link uh, that ISME number, ISME is the abbreviation for International Standard Manuscript Identifier. You can link that in a Schoenberg database record um, to make those connections and make the passage from, is from an ISME record to the Schoenberg database, for example, a bit more fluid. Um, and so, so what this model represents is just kind of like the sort of basic things that you need to get access to a manuscript. So not a lot of data, not a lot of information, but something that's kind of light and easy to create and enter and maintain. Um, just to wrap up a little bit, uh, more questions. Uh, how do we scale up to a national level and attract membership? Um, we have challenges for that. They're financial challenges, especially now. People don't have, all, institutions don't have a lot of money to shell out uh, for a DS membership. There's already a lot of data available online, and I'm just putting up two examples from Penn, um, Open, which is the most up-to-date uh, catalog we have of our manuscripts that feeds into our online catalog and also uh, can be downloaded 
for free by anyone in the world to do whatever you want to with. So uh, just to play devil's advocate, why is Penn still a member of Digital Scriptorium if we have this resource? Uh, and full disclosure, we haven't even updated our Digital Scriptorium records in a number of years because it's, it's too hard to do both. It's, it takes too much effort, too much energy, and you want something that's, you know, provides that low barrier. Uh, we also have Bibliophily, and Bibliophily is an extension of OPEN, and it sort of represents a regional union catalog uh, of, of uh, collections in the Philadelphia area. Um, finally, how do we work uh, collaborative, collaboratively on a national and international level? Do we share data? How? Uh, these are all important questions that we need to be considering as we move forward in the next couple of weeks. And to end on sustainability, um, we have some sort of basic practical questions. How do we manage the platform? Where does DS 2.0 live? Staffing, who's gonna add the data and who's gonna manage it? Is it a digital scriptorium staff person or is it someone in a library with a collection? Financing, um, how do we pay for what we want it to be? Uh, these are sort of the nuts and bolts and we're not necessarily expecting you to worry about this. In fact, we don't actually want you to worry about the money at this point. Um, but they are, they are things that we're going to have to, you know, at the end of this planning period, be able to answer. So I'm going to end there um, and hand it over to Emma. Thank Before we start, you. can I make one comment about, I don't want to interrupt Lynn, but when she uh, mentioned about the cutoff date for manuscripts and digital scriptorium, there's never been one, and especially the policy has always been to recognize the autonomy of the institutional contributors to decide what they are, what collections they think belong in digital scriptorium. So they decide what we mean by pre-modern manuscripts. And, um, and for, so, and uh, also I wanted to mention that part of the aspirations of the grant that we wrote were to expand that idea of what, what pre-modern manuscripts means, especially beyond Western manuscripts and um, to include um, manuscripts from the manuscript cultures from uh, all, you know, in an inter international way. And I, I can tell you that um, when I cataloged all the manuscripts at St. Louis, which are they're all, only 66 records, but all of St. Louis's manuscripts are in DS, uh, all their Western and non-Western, including all the way up and they date all the way to the 20th century. There's an Ethiopian, um, Ethiopic manuscript in there that looks like a medieval manuscript but was made in the 20th century. So I just wanted to add that, thanks. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, I'm chatting out now a link to what I'll be talking about, which is um, the results of our institutional survey. That's also in the folder in the chat too. I think you're muted, Emma. Thank you for whoever told me I was muted. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so let me start again. Um, I wrote this survey with the help of the DS 2.0 steering committee. Um, that includes Lynn Ransom, Deborah Cashin, Lisa Fagan Davis, Ray Clemens, and Liz Hebbard. So thanks again to all of you for helping with this. Um, we opened the survey from September 8th to September 30th of this year, and we distributed it on the DS mailing list and also the DCRM list. And 
Um, we did um, a pretty targeted publicity for this because we wanted institutional collection managers specifically um, to submit to this survey. So we didn't want everyone and their mother on Ex Libris um, taking the survey. So we got 32 total responses and we did limit submissions to one response per institution. And it's also limited to US institutions only since this grant is to develop a national union catalog. Um, and we divided the survey up into three sections, questions about the current state of DS membership, um, and then questions to get metrics about institutional collections and how they're cataloging and digitizing their manuscripts now. And then the final section relates to uh, questions about DS 2.0. So for the membership questions, we asked if institutions are currently a member of Digital Scriptorium. And we got um, a pretty even split here between people who are members and who aren't. And this is a map showing you where our responses came from. Um, the darker blue indicates more responses and the lighter you indicates uh, fewer responses. So we got a lot of people from California and New York and Pennsylvania submitting um, to the survey, but also a pretty good um, spread across the country as far as manuscript collections are concerned. We asked what are or would be the benefits in maintaining a DS membership for your institution. Um, and this was a free form question, so uh, um, people could write as long of a response as they wanted. And four main keywords kept popping up over and over again, which I put in the left column here. Um, accessibility, visibility, discoverability, and exposure. So um, it appears that DSM right now really helps people um, share their manuscript data with others and increases the, the visibility of their collections. Um, respondents also mentioned DS helps them collaborate with colleagues and find connections from their collections um, to other con collections around the country. Um, someone mentioned that by um, participating in DS, they learn how other libraries are describing and digitizing their collections. And um, another respondent said that DS opens up avenues um, for help with cataloging um, in formats that are unfamiliar to them. So we then asked what are the challenges in maintaining a DS membership and not surprisingly, almost everyone mentioned money. Um, <laughs> that was the um, overwhelmingly um, winning response here, but people also mentioned um, staff resources and staff time as being um, an issue for maintaining membership. Um, also the difficulty in updating records um, and two institutions mentioned proprietary concerns um, because their institutions are developing uh, products that are somewhat similar to DS and so DS um, competes with them in a way. So now we're into the institutional uh, questions. We asked what the total materials budget at your institution is. Um, we got a pretty wide range, but 37% um, said their budget was less than a million. Um, and then 34% said their budget was between one and eight million. Um, so we're looking at the majority of the respondents here had a budget of less than eight million. We asked about the size of the student body at the institutions. Here we got an even wider range of responses, including 23% um, saying they don't have students um, at all. But um, so here's just showing the, um, the variety of the, the sizes of institutions that submitted to the survey. We asked how many pre-modern manuscript objects your institution owns. Um, Again, a pretty wide range of responses. The most common response was um, over 600 at 37% of respondents. Um, but also a quarter of the respondents um, have between five and 50 manuscript objects. Um, so we're looking at um, a wide range of collection sizes. Next, we asked about um, the regional makeup of your manuscript collections. Um, 
and these this was a, a checkbox and these are just estimated percentages so we weren't asking for precise numbers here um, so for manuscripts produced in Africa um, most uh, institutions either have no material from Africa or 20% um, or less. Um, for America, similar responses here, though we did get um, a couple of institutions where um, they have more uh, material from the Americas. From Asia, again, um, less than 20% um, is the, the scope here. Even more um, for Australasia, um, just a couple places had any manuscripts uh, from that region. Um, from Europe, not surprisingly, this is where um, the bulk of the collections are focused, um, but we do see a range here, um, and that um, plays into the next region as well. Um, so when we ask about manuscripts produced in the Middle East, we see um, a lot of institutions have at least some material um, from the Middle East. So this is something that we should consider as we're discussing the scope of this national union catalog we're building. Um, if we're limiting it to just European manuscripts, um, we're gonna be leaving out a lot of the manuscript material um, in the United States. Next, we asked if your institution already has an online catalog for its manuscripts. Um, 45% said that they do. Um, and then a lot of people had um, uh, a nuanced response to this in the other category. And you can see here, um, a lot of institutions provide their manuscript data in the general library catalog. Um, three institutions mentioned that not all of their manuscripts are cataloged, um, and two institutions use DS as their online catalog. We asked what percentage of the manuscripts at your institution are currently cataloged. Um, 63% um, said that they had between 75 and 100% of their collections cataloged, um, which is pretty good, but we did see a range of responses here. So there, there are a lot of uncatalogued manuscripts out there. We also asked what percentage of the manuscripts are digitized. And here we see a much wider range um, in responses and the majority here actually, 34% um, said um, they have between zero and 25% of their manuscripts catalog or digitized. And then we asked if your institution has the equipment and personnel in place for the digitization of special collections. And the majority here um, said that they do have the technology needed to digitize. Um, so this is something to consider um, as we remember in the previous question where um, um, it's uh, not, um, not, oh, I'm sorry, let me just look at this, um, where it's not standard for the whole collection of manuscripts to be digitized right now. Um, so we see that libraries or institutions have uh, the dis digitization technology, but um, either manuscripts are not a priority for being digitized first, or um, I'm sure there's conservation issues present, uh, preventing a lot of manuscripts from being digitized as well. Um, next, we asked about the data formats that institutions are publishing their manuscript descriptions in. And this is important to consider um, if we're wanting to ingest data into DS 2.0, we need to know um, what formats we need to crosswalk from. Um, not surprisingly, Mark is the, the winner here, um, but also a lot of descriptions are appearing in plain text um, finding aids and PDFs and Word documents. Um, and notice as well, um, no one that submitted the survey is currently publishing their manuscript data in RDF or BibFrame, and these are the two um, linked data standards. Um, that we mentioned in the survey. So this is potentially an, era, an area where DS could, um, could come in and um, change how manuscripts are being described. Um, and then we asked um, if, you, if you use a different standard to tell us. So um, people are also using mods, content VM, DAX, and JSON. 
we asked if institutions employ at least one staff member whose primary role involves manuscript collections. Here we saw an even split um, between the yeses and the noes. So about half of the institutions um, that responded to our survey have a dedicated manuscript staff member. We asked what controlled vocabularies your institution is using um, in its descriptions. Not surprisingly, the Library of Congress standards um, were the most common since most people are using MARC to catalog their manuscripts. Um, so the Library of Congress subject headings and the genre form terms um, appear a lot. Also the Getty vocabularies are used often. Um, people also mentioned RBMS, um, Legatus's language of bindings, FAST, which is based off of the Library of Congress subject headings, and also the DCRM controlled vocabularies. So we'll need to consider um, all of these vocabularies as we're building DS 2.0 um, because that will increase um, DS's interoperability. We asked if institutions are exposing their descriptions as linked open data. And most either aren't 60% um, or um, a lot of people were uncertain about this question. We asked if your institution can store its own IIIF compliant images and half of the institutions have this ability at the moment. Um, again, a lot of uh, uncertainty here. And then we asked uh, if your institution can publish its own IIIF images. Pretty similar responses um, to the ability to store question. We also asked if your institution is following the OAI PMH standards for manuscript data. Um, OAI PMH is a standard that um, allows you to do um, metadata harvesting pretty easily. Um, so if institutions were using this, this could potentially be a good avenue um, for DS to follow if we wanted to um, ingest data easily. Um, unfortunately, barely anyone um, is using OAI PMH, at least as far as our survey respondents are concerned. We asked if institutions are willing to make their data and images open access and freely available. 80% responded yes, that's great. And then we asked about the level of open access um, that your institution would be willing to support. This was another um, open-ended response. So I just summarized here that 19 of the responses said they would be fine with no restrictions. Um, nine institutions would wanna place some restrictions on who could download or use images specifically. Um, and then seven respondents weren't certain about this. So now we're up to the DS 2.0 questions. We asked what level of metadata would be sufficient for a DS 2.0 manuscript entry. Um, the winning response is a full description. 70% of respondents wanted this. Um, and then um, about a quarter of the respondents said a brief identifying record would be sufficient. And then we, got, we did get three other responses and I reproduced them on the next slide in full because I think they each bring up some really important issues that we'll need to consider over the next couple of days um, as we're thinking about the future of DS. So the first response said that they're interested in contributing as much data as possible without raising the bar too high for small institutions. Um, and this is a, a big issue that we need to consider, and it's a question that we've asked you to work on in your breakout groups, um, is how we balance the needs of large and small institutions. Um, if we create a really rich um, data model, um, will in small institutions that don't have the cataloging support or the curatorial support be able to contribute to DS um, if we have a, a huge record that they need to fill out? Um, the second response said a rich range of fields within the description that are searchable seems ideal because we can link to a fuller description, but the searchability of the various data is of enormous benefit. Um, and this is, this is a great point. Um, we all want to create a data set that is um, rich and allows us to create um, interesting research questions 
from it. Um, but I did want to mention that a fuller description doesn't necessarily mean better searchability. Um, the, the structure of the data is what makes it um, searchable. So if you're following controlled vocabularies, um, if you're linking to other data sets, um, if the data is standardized in some way. So um, as you're thinking about, um, you know, this full manuscript description that you're looking for, um, be sure to think about how that data is going to be standardized because that's what creates searchable data. Um, and then the third um, response was that brief is preferable as it decreases the need to update multiple repositories when new information is learned. So um, this response is pointing out um, one of the benefits of going with a briefer record is there's less data to manage, there's less data to update, it takes less time to update. Um, so there are downsides to both options and I think finding a balance between the two um, is gonna be the main goal of the DS 2.0 project. Um, so we asked what level of digitization would be sufficient for a DS 2.0 manuscript entry. And um, the options were no digitization, single images, sample images, or cover to cover. 40% um, of respondents said a sample would be sufficient, but um, about a quarter of people said that no, no digitization is necessary, which I thought was interesting. Um, so I think there's a range of expectations here that we'll all have to work out together as far as digitization is concerned. We asked respondents to rank on a one to five scale, one being non-important, five being extremely important. Um, how important DS 2.0's ability to collaborate with international partners and projects is. And most respondents said that it was at least somewhat important, if not very important, that we collaborate with international partners. And then we asked the same question type about DS's ability to use linked open data um, to um, share its data. And again, most people said this was at least somewhat important. Um, I think as we learn more about linked open data together over the coming days, um, I think these responses might change um, because it, it's very important. <laughs> um, and then the final question was, what other features and functions would you like to see in DS 2.0? And this was, again, another open response field. So I just summarized the responses that occurred at least more than once on this slide. Um, a lot of people mentioned authority control, um, which we've already mentioned. Um, uh, in previous slides, that's definitely a doable goal. I think there's a lot of controlled vocabularies out there already. We can, we can integrate those into DS with ease. Um, respondents also mentioned um, the cost to participate as being a, a problem with the current model of DS. Um, and of course, money is always an issue, I think especially now um, with this acute uh, financial crisis, but um, we, this maybe isn't a problem that we'll be able to solve during the planning meetings, but it is an issue with sustainability. Um, respondents also mentioned that they'd like um, it to be easier to contribute data to DS. A couple people said we should be more like ecodices, <laughs> which is probably good advice, and we'll be hearing more about ecodices on Thursday. Um, a couple respondents also mentioned that linking to um, or incorporating Schoenberg database of manuscripts data would be good. Um, the Schoenberg database is a manuscript database that's used for provenance research and has a lot of rich provenance data. Um, people also mentioned linked open data and also um, they were wishing for better documentation for new users and contributors. So how are we doing on time? Okay, good. So that's all of the questions. Um, are there um, any questions that I can answer about the survey? Lisa. Uh, hi, hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to just throw out just because I think it'll be useful for people to know in the work that Melissa Conway and I did in our uh, directory from 2015, 
We identified more than 500 collections in North America um, as having pre-1600 European manuscript holdings, and that was about 25,000 codices and somewhere between 30 and 35,000 leaves, fragments, uh, and cuttings. And that's not even counting documents, which are a whole different universe. I mean, just tens of thousands of, of documents. Um, but the vast majority of those collections only have a handful of items. So the, you know, the biggest, the 10 largest collections hold half the objects, just to give everyone a sense of the, of the scope. That's really helpful. Thanks, Lisa. Any other questions about the survey? All right, well, um, that's it for the presentation uh, portion of the day. Um, we did factor into the schedule um, time for 